Good evening. Welcome to Ramsey Baptist Church and our pre-recorded version of our evening service. I want to begin with a word of scripture as normal. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. This evening we are worshipping the God whose name is excellent. It is the most excellent name. He's the one who has set his glory above the heavens. And what an amazing thing it is that we can come into the presence of this glorious God this evening to worship him in spirit and in truth. Let's just begin then with a word of prayer, asking for his blessing and his help this evening. O oh Lord, we humble ourselves again before your greatness this evening. Help us, we pray, to experience your glory, to see it and to know it, and fill us with love and with joy in our Saviour by the power of your Spirit. Help us to know this evening that we are indeed kept by your power, even as we worship you in spirit and in truth. Speak to us through your word and bless this time that we have together to your honour and to your glory. Amen. Well, our opening hymn this evening is, is a great hymn of praise to God, in which we ask the question, God, who is like you? So, our opening hymn then, Who is like you, Father, also known as Hallowed Be Your Name. like you, Father, the source of life and love, an overflowing fountain in spirit and the sun. Oh 
Now, before we come to prayer this evening, I just want to mention a specific country that has been on my mind a lot over recent weeks, China. Christianity is growing in China and it is growing very rapidly. By November 2019, over 200 million Chinese Union version Bibles had been produced. And it's estimated that there are over 100 million believers today in China. The church is growing tremendously in communist China. But so is the state oppression of the church. Just this month, new laws uh, came into effect in China to establish a database listing all those authorised by the communist state to engage in religious activities, whether leading worship, teaching or studying religion. The law, which applies actually to all religions, states that religious organisations must conduct formal assessments of their leaders and apply rewards and punishments, which will also be recorded in the database. The authorities can insist that a religious organisation cancel the religious qualifications of any individual, thus depriving that person of the right to engage in religious activities. We need to pray that uh, Chinese Christians will have wisdom from above as they learn to live with these new regulations and that the message of the gospel will continue to be proclaimed and that the church will continue to grow. So having uh, just given you that brief update, we're now going to turn to prayer. And of course, China will feature uh, in the prayer that we're going to pray. Let's just pray together, shall we? Our Father God in heaven, we praise you for the massive growth of your church in China. We pray for our brothers and sisters in that land. Lord, fill them with grace and wisdom that they may know how to respond to these latest changes in the law. Give them courage to persevere to the end with their eyes fixed on your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in your grace, may the church in China continue to grow. Father, we ask too that you would be pleased to work in the hearts of key leaders at, at every level of Chinese government. We pray, Lord, that they would be servant leaders with integrity and focus on the needs of those they lead. We pray, Lord, too, that they would see their need of you, that government leaders at every level would be turning to your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and putting their trust in him. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege that it is for us to pray for our so uh, suffering brethren. Lord, we thank you too for our recent experiences of restrictions in, in our worship here. Lord, they, they help us to perhaps realise just, just a little of what others face every single day as they seek to serve you. Help us therefore, Lord, to not just sympathise with our brethren and, and pray for them, but also to be filled with thankfulness and to rejoice in the freedoms that we have. Help us, Lord, to be those who are making the most of all that we can do, and not complaining about the things that we can't do. Give us grateful hearts. Help us to persevere to the end. For Lord, we confess that it is hard. There are times we are tired times we have been beaten down by the world, by temptation, by our trials and our difficulties, times we just want to give up and throw in the towel. Oh, help us to persevere. Keep us by your power. Help us, even in the challenges that we will face in the days of this week, to stick to following the Lord Jesus Christ and to not give up. Lord, forgive us for every sin, we pray our secret sins, as well as our public sins, our sins of omission, as well as our sins of commission. Help us to know as we look into your word this evening, what you have to say to us. Speak to us through it, we ask, to your praise and to your glory. Amen. Well, our Bible reading this evening is uh, taken from Acts chapter 14, and we're going to read together uh, the whole chapter, verses 1 to 28. So Acts chapter 14, 
beginning to read together uh, at verse 1. Now it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews, and so spoke that a great multitude both of Jews and of the Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Therefore they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding region, and they were preaching the gospel there. And in Lystra a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking. Paul, observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. Now when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gate, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in amongst the multitude, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitude from sacrificing to them. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitude, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. Now when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Atta, Atalia, and from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had completed. Now when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them, and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Oh, may God bless what we've read from his word. And may he speak to us clearly through it uh, as we look into this portion of his word. And as we look again at this man that we're studying, this uh, Barnabas, may we learn more of what it means from his example to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Many people are great at starting a task. They will embrace it with enthusiasm and with energy. But for some, somewhere along the line, that enthusiasm wanes, that, that energy dissipates, and, and the job is not completed. It's left half finished. Something is begun, but it is not finished. In fact, there are TV series, aren't there, that have run for many seasons, built around this human tendency to begin things but not finish them. To leave jobs half done. DIY SOS is perhaps one of the best known. Someone has started a project around their home. They had grand plans to renovate their home, but, but they never saw the task through to completion. They never finished what they started. And so their family are left living uh, in a mess. And a team of experts will come in in that program and they will finish off the job that was started. 
Well, we can face a similar thing in Christian service. Things are begun but not finished. Projects are started but not seen through to completion. We've actually seen that in this series, haven't we? John Mark, he began a task but he didn't finish it. He set off with Barnabas and Saul on this missionary journey. But after their first stop in Cyprus, he returned home to Jerusalem. He begun something, but he didn't finish. He started, but he didn't see it through to the end. But Barnabas is very different to John Mark. He is the sort of person who does finish what he starts. He is the sort of person who does persevere to the end. He set out on this missionary journey, and when he set out, he was the leader. But in Cyprus, he had to take a step back as Saul, or Paul as he becomes known uh, now, takes over. He had the disappointment of his cousin, John Mark, deserting them. And he had to face persecution, which as we read this evening is getting worse, is intensifying. But he stays the course because Barnabas is the type of man who finishes what he starts. Barnabas is a man who once he has put his hand to the plough, he does not look back. He keeps his eyes fixed on the goal and he presses on towards it. So tonight, this is what I want us to think about. I want us to think about finishing what we have started. Finishing what we have started. We have started following the Lord Jesus Christ. I trust you can say that, that you have started following the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we need to finish what we have started. You need to finish your life following the Lord Jesus Christ. We have started to bring our two fellowships together as Ramsey Baptist Church, and we've made great progress in that. But we need to finish what we have started now. We have started outreach works. We need to stick to that task. We need to finish what we have started. Maybe you're, you're praying for a specific person that, that they will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. And maybe you're witnessing to them and it's been going on for a long time and you see so little progress. You need to stick to the task. You need to finish what you have started. Don't leave the job half done. Don't give up and throw in the towel. Finish what you have started. Why? Because the Lord Jesus Christ says, no one having put his hand to the plough and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Luke 9 verse 62, Christians are people who finish what they start. And as we come to the text and think about finishing what we have started, I want you to notice, first of all, opportunity and opposition. Opportunity and opposition. These are two things that usually go hand in hand. Where God is at work, where the gospel is being proclaimed, the devil is there opposing the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been amazed by what I've been discovering about China in, in recent weeks. It's estimated there are over 100 million believers in China. Church growth is exploding in China. But so is that state opposition to Christianity. New laws passed in February 2020, which give the state power over every aspect of church life. House churches closed, pastors imprisoned, more new laws just passed this month, allowing the government to keep this database, this register on every church leader and minister and what they teach. Opportunity and opposition going hand in hand. And we've seen that in this first missionary journey that Barnabas participates in, haven't we? We've seen that in Cyprus, when Barnabas and Saul are witnessing to the proconsul Sergius Paulus, that Elymas opposes them. There is opposition. In Antioch Pisidia, the Jews stirred up the town council against Paul and Barnabas, forcing them to leave the region and move on to the next place. And this is where we pick up uh, the account this evening. They journey to Iconium. They journey to Iconium. Read with me from verse 1. Now it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude both of Jews and of the Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Therefore they stayed there a long time speaking boldly in the Lord who was bearing witness to the word of his grace granting signs and wonders to be done by
by their hands. Notice again that, that they're together. Paul and Barnabas are united in their gospel work. And notice the success that the Lord gives them. A great multitude, both of Jews and of the Greeks, believed. But notice also the opposition. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against them. They poisoned people's minds against Paul and Barnabas. It's a graphic description, isn't it, of a type of behavior that, that sadly we're all too familiar with. Gossip, slander, false accusation, all meant to discredit Paul and Barnabas so people wouldn't listen to them, so people wouldn't embrace the gospel. Where there is opportunity, there is also opposition. Where there is opportunity, there is also opposition. Just as the Lord Jesus Christ was opposed in his ministry, so Barnabas and Paul are opposed here. And we can expect this. You and I, we can expect to meet the same opposition. There will be people out there who are seeking to poison people's minds against us. And the devil's primary targets in that, well, they are going to be our leaders, our church officers, our deacons and our elders. What better way is there to rob a pastor of his ability to teach than to undermine the congregation's confidence in him through gossip and slander? It's effective and it's easy. But notice the response of Paul and Barnabas to this type of opposition. They stayed at Iconium. They stayed at Iconium, verse 3. Therefore, they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord. Therefore, they stayed. It's interesting, isn't it? They stayed because of the opposition. It was the opposition that caused them to stay longer. Yes, they move on later when the danger becomes physical, as we see in verses 5 and 6. But whilst it's just slander, they stayed. They are determined to finish what they have started. They're not put off by this opposition. No, the opposition energizes them to work harder. It, it encourages them to put more effort in. And there is a lesson for us here in this. If the devil opposes where there is opportunity, then where we see opportunity, then we, sorry, where we see opposition, we can assume that there is also opportunity. Our, our efforts need to be intensified in the face of opposition. Opposition does not mean we throw in the towel and give up. It means we intensify our efforts. We stay but we are opposed. Notice also that they divided Iconium. They divided Iconium, verse 4. But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles. And again, isn't this what the gospel does? The gospel divides. There's no sitting on the fence when it comes to Christianity. You are either siding with the Lord Jesus Christ against your sin or you are siding with your sin against the Lord Jesus Christ. It is that clear cut. It is that black and white. There are no shades of grey here. There is no fence sitting here. There is no foot in both camps. You are either siding with the Lord Jesus Christ against your sin, or you are siding with your sin against the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel divides, and it divides families. Families where one person is a believer and the rest are unsaved. There's a division there, isn't there, caused by the gospel. Gospel divides friends and it divides communities as we see here. Iconium is divided. It's split in two. Many believe, but many do not. And those who don't, well, they oppose the gospel work of Paul and Barnabas. And in the end, the opposition becomes dangerous. It becomes life-threatening. So eventually, Paul and Barnabas move on. And there's no shame in that. They're following the instructions of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said in Matthew 20, verse 23, when they persecute you in this city, flee to another. And that brings them to Lystra. And our second point this evening, who gets the glory? Who gets the glory? One of the temptations that you and I will face along the way as we press on in our Christian service, as we persevere to the end in our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, as we seek to finish what we have started, is this temptation to take the credit, to 
Let our egos take over. You know, this morning we were thinking about the glory battle. And this is one of the ways the glory battle can be lost. As you all know, I do teach that every single one of us needs to be a son of encouragement to those around us. That we need to be building one another up in the faith. And the longer this age continues, the closer we get to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, the more important this aspect of our Christianity becomes. Meetings like this are, of course, primarily in praise and worship. We are here to exalt the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to lift his name up on high. But second to that is this need to be an encouragement to one another. In Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25, we read, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. We have to be encouraging one another. But there is a corresponding danger in this, something we need to be careful of as we seek to encourage one another. And that is the temptation that when you are being encouraged by those around you, is that you begin to take the credit. It begins to build your ego up. You forget to give the glory to God. You know, at best we are unprofitable servants. And we are never to replace the master. This is one way we can lose the glory battle. We begin to live for these encouragements. We begin to take credit to ourselves. We, we begin to build up our ego. When Paul and Barnabas come to Lystra, this is the temptation that they're faced with. The question is, will they fall at this hurdle? Or will they finish what they have started? Will they press on through it, looking to God and giving the glory to the Lord Jesus Christ as these people seek to glorify them? Will they finish what they have started? Well, let's examine the scene. In Lystra, they meet a man who's been crippled from birth, verse 8. Paul, seeing this man's faith, heals him, verses 9 and 10. What I want you to draw your attention to, though, is the reaction of the crowd, verse 11. Now, when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lysonian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. Then the priests of Zeus, whose temples in the front of their city brought oxen and garlands to the gate, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. So that's the scene. That's what's going on. That's what's happening. Now think about the temptation. The people are giving Paul and Barnabas the credit. The people are saying to Paul and Barnabas, you are great. Your gods come to visit us. And notice which one is Zeus. And Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes. Hermes was the messenger. Zeus in Greek thinking there. Well, well, he's the leader of the gods. He's the father of the Greek gods. So this crowd, they look at Paul and they look at Barnabas and they not only give them the credit for this miracle, but they determine that Barnabas, probably because he's the older man and the one who's not the main speaker, well, he must be the, the leader. This must have been a particular temptation to him. He'd step back from that leadership role. And here are these people calling him the leader. Notice in verse 14 that suddenly when it comes to responding to this situation, Barnabas is mentioned first again. That gives us the hint that this is a particular temptation for him. It's a double temptation for Barnabas to let this praise go to his head, especially as these people are treating him as if he's superior to Paul. It would have been so easy for Barnabas to let his ego get in the way here, to lose the glory battle right here, to begin to believe some of what has been said about him, to begin to take some of the credit for himself to enjoy this reception and to put his own glory first for a while. It would have been so easy for him to lose the glory battle here. I know how easy it would be because sometimes I can be tempted in a similar way. Now, I've never been mistaken for a Greek god, 
But it is easy, isn't it, for me to think, well, I did really well with that sermon today. Rather than give God the glory for how Jesus Christ has spoken through the sermon I've preached. And we are all tempted by the same thing. To take credit for ourselves. To let our egos get in the way. To put what we want for ourselves first. We are all tempted to lose the glory battle in this fashion. But consider the response. Look at how Barnabas and Paul respond to this. Verse 14. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in amongst the multitude. Look at the grief. They tore their clothes, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made heaven and earth, the sea and all things that is in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. I'm not looking at that in detail this evening. All I really want to highlight tonight is the refusal of Barnabas and Paul to accept this adulation of the crowd, especially when it appears Barnabas takes the lead in this response. That's what I want you to see. Here's this double temptation for Barnabas, and, and he's grieved by what this crowd are, are doing for him. He doesn't want this. He's not going to let his ego be swelled by this. He's not going to let his ego get in the way of God's glory. Paul and Barnabas are grieved by this behavior. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes. Paul and Barnabas give God the glory. They point the people away from themselves and they point them to God. And actually, as you read on, you see that Paul pays the price. Paul pays the price. Verse 19, then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. It's not immediately after. It's not the same day. No, it's evident that Paul is on his own when this happens. And verse 20 tells us that there were disciples. There were converts in Lystra. So this is probably uh, days, if not weeks or even months later. But the persecution has caught up with Paul and Barnabas. So whilst God preserves Paul's life, verse 20, it's time to move on. And they move on to Derby, where we read, And when they had preached the gospel, this is verse 20, to the city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. And this brings me to my final point uh, this evening. Finishing what was started. Finishing what was started. They've been on the road for over a year, possibly up to about 18 months. They have traveled hundreds of miles and they have preached the gospel to many people. They have seen converts. They have planted churches. They've also faced personal challenges, great opposition in the form of persecution, and they've been tempted. But they have stayed the course. Barnabas and Paul have stayed the course. And in the last few chapters of, uh, sorry, the last few verses of this chapter, which we'll look at in a bit more detail next week, we get to see how Paul and Barnabas finish together what they started together. They revisit the churches they have planted and they encourage the believers, verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. You know, our work is never done in just sowing the gospel seed. Believers need to be taught. We all need to be encouraged in our faith. And so Paul and Barnabas go back and they revisit the churches they have planted to encourage the believers there. And they appoint leaders to continue the work in those places. They appoint elders in the churches, verse 23. So when they had appointed elders in every church, they prayed with fasting. They commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Of course, it's a serious matter, isn't it? To appoint elders in a church. 
It's accompanied here by prayer and fasting. And then these men who are appointed to this position, they are committed to God in prayer. I hope you do that. I hope you pray for your elders. I hope you commit us to God in prayer every single day. And they report back to their home church, verse 27. Now, when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. The church that sent them, they report back to. Their work is not done until they have reported back on the task they were set to do by this church. And then after that, once they've reported back, well, then they get their well-earned rest, verse 28. So they stayed there a long time with the disciples. They finished what they started. They persevered through personal challenges, through ministry problems, through persecution, through temptation to finish what they had started. They didn't let their egos get in the way of finishing what they had started. That's the example of Barnabas. Barnabas is someone who stays the course. Barnabas is someone who doesn't throw in the towel, but he completes the task he has been given without cutting corners. He finishes what he starts. And for us, I would suggest there is obvious and immediate application. As we come out of this lockdown, we need to finish what we have started. We need to finish what we've started in bringing our two churches together. Ramsey Baptist Church needs to become a legal as well as spiritual reality. And one of the challenges that we're going to face in in making this happen is letting our egos get in the way. You know, I was told when we started this project of bringing our two churches together that if it goes well, God gets the glory. If it goes wrong, I get the blame. But the truth is, Ramsey Baptist Church is not my legacy. It's not about me, and it's not about you either. It's about the glory of God. It's about exalting the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in our town. So there's no room for, for our egos to get in the way. There's no credit for us to take in bringing our two churches together. And in Barnabas, we see the Christ-like humility that every single one of us needs. And even more vividly, in what we've considered this evening, we see this Christ-honoring reaction to, to this temptation that, that we all face on occasions to let our egos get in the way to make things more about us than they are about Christ, to be a servant who seeks to replace the master. In Barnabas, we get the Christ-honoring reaction to that, the grief and the determination to give God the glory. You know, before COVID struck, we were, we were talking and discussing what building should be used for what. Well, we've seen, haven't we, over this past year, just how easily the Lord can take both our buildings away when he chooses to do so. We've been shut out of them. We've been forced online. As we come back to them now, what a wonderful thing that is. But let's make sure that as these discussions continue and as we, as we look for a vision for how we can use the, the assets we have to reach out into this community with the gospel, Let's make sure our egos don't rise to the surface. As we think about what meetings will continue and, and which will stop, let's make sure our egos don't rise to the surface. As all of our roles change, when we're either asked to step back from something or to step up to something, let's make sure our egos don't rise to the surface. When we see how this coming together of our churches evolves us as a church and grows us and develops us. Let's make sure it's not all about us. Let's make sure we're giving God the glory, that we are doing it all for him. That's the example we have of Barnabas. In his reaction to this temptation to make it all about him, he gives God the glory. He points people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, he's the one you need to serve. And in closing, in Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2, we read, Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him 
endured the cross. Let's finish together. Let's finish together what we have started together, with our eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And in everything, in everything we do as a church, in everything you do as an individual, do it for the Lord Jesus Christ. May this be our testimony, that we have persevered, that we have pressed on, that we have run the race with endurance, fixing our eyes on the Lord Jesus. That we finish what we start as faithful and willing servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's resist the temptation to ever consider ourselves greater than him to ever replace him in our hearts with self, to ever be driven by our own egos rather than God's glory. Instead, let's look to him as humble servants because this is how it's done. This is how it's done. Fixing our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ as his humble servants, looking to him every step of the way, doing it all for his glory, pressing on in faith in him in this endurance race of life that we are running. This is how we finish what we have started. This is how we follow Barnabas' example. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Amen. Well, having just been talking about keeping your eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ as being the way to persevere and finish what we start, this final hymn reminds us of, of just how sweet the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is to us. And I hope and pray that that will be your experience in the days of this week as you fix your eyes on him, as you press on in the faith, that his name would be sweet in your ear. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in the believer's ears.
Well, thank you so much for joining with me this evening. I hope you found this time in God's Word a real blessing and a real help to you as you seek to live your life for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to close our time now with a word of prayer. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Saviour who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Thank you.